Knocks it through. Mullen bursting into the box. Josh Mullen. Mullen's ball across. It's turned in. It's Pittman who's got it. Livingston leads. Now can they get the ball back in? O'Brien. The lead. And Livingston have the lead. Man, the score. The full time whistle blows and David Hay celebrates. And the Livingston fans join in exultation. Livingston had the lead against Rangers. And they are certainly rising to a few occasions on their return to the top flight in Scotland. Hello and welcome back to Talk Livy, the podcast dedicated to everything Livingston Football Club and Scottish football. My name's Ewan and today I'm joined by, well, every Livy fan's favourite journalist. It's the Airdrie slash Wrexham slash Minnesota slash <laughs> Wales slash Scotland fan, uh, Callum Carson. Carson, how you doing? I don't mind. I, I'm, I'm sure you get all my teams there, but probably not. Probably <laughs> not. There, mu- there must be one that f- fell through. I've, I can't remember the baseball teams and the ice hockey teams. Oh, I, I, I know they all start with Minnesota. So Minnesota covered it all. That's about 12 different teams there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we'll start the episode off by taking a look back at our game with Ross County as the Lions left it late to rescue a point. And we're at the halfway point in the season as well. So we'll review the first half of the season and our hopes for the remainder of the campaign. And I also spoke with Dylan, who runs the Viva Motherwell account on Twitter, to discuss our visit to Fur Park and what we can expect from the Steel Men. It was a big game for the Lions as Ross County made the trip down from the Highlands. It would prove to be a KG game with an Io Obelai header rescuing a point late on. Carson, you were covering the game as always. Uh, what did you make of it? The only positive thing to say was that it wasn't a defeat, I think, to be honest. The performance wasn't great. It was kind of quite cagey, as you said. The, I don't think Ross County were particularly brilliant, in fairness. But I, obviously, that's what the third or fourth time this season now the Lions have kind of rescued a point or a win right at the death. So. These kind of 89th, 90th minute goals could prove pretty crucial come the end of the season. Yeah, it was that, wasn't it? It was just that. The way I kind of described it while I was watching the game, it came across that neither team wanted to lose in the Aye. first half. And I guess, yeah. it, it just came across as that kind of must not lose mentality to the game. And I think they just kind of cancelled each other out. But certainly in the first half, the only real talking points I had, there was a couple of penalty shouts in the first half, both with involving Craig Sibbald. What did you make of the first one? I think it was a challenge by Baldwin. I, I didn't, I'll be honest, I didn't have the greatest of views of either of them, if I'm being honest, and I've not kind of seen the footage back yet. But I didn't think there were penalties at the time, although going from social media comments, I, I think at least one of them, probably the first one that you were talking about, kind of seemed like it could have been given, certainly. Yeah, looking, uh, I watched sports scene uh, just before doing this, and the first one is from two angles, it doesn't look like an awful lot. And then the last angle, you go, eh, there's maybe something in it. It's one of those, I think, 50 50 ones you could maybe get and maybe not. The handball one, I think, it's hands quite close, it's to the body and things like that. I don't think it's, I don't think it's a clear shout, but. The next talking point was the goal right on the stroke of half time from Concola. Couple of defensive slip ups in there. Io, Penners, Max, not all not looking too clever uh, for the goal. I um, James Penrice is clearance. It's just I don't know if he's just thought there's twenty seconds to go. Just boot it as far as I can. But he's literally 
put it central to goal 30 yards out. You know, that's the one thing you don't do in a defensive clearance. Again, kind of watching it live at a time, I thought it was some hit from the boy Cancola. Having seen the goal back, it definitely looks like Max could have done better. He gets a proper hand to it. If it's a fingertip, maybe you can say, oh, you know, he's maybe not got enough on it, but he's got a right good part of his hand on the ball. So you're hoping he can do more than he did, really. Yeah, it's one of, there was a lot of folk talking about Io's involvement in the goal, but I think, you know, we're in a position where we can deal with it when the ball comes to Penners in the box. Yeah. yeah. And I think if Penners clears the ball That's wide. The Totally. Uh, nothing nothing comes of it and we get in at half time now now but uh, as you say initially you're going that's ah, a good strike but seeing it back you know he's not he's not really whipped it it's not got a no. lot of pace on it and it's actually bending back in towards Max as well mm-hmm. uh, when, and as you say he gets a really good hand test so I think probably could do better but I think I think you can let Max off with some of the heroics he's produced in our, our recent Aye. results you know the Ross County game, for example, is the penalty save at, at Celtic Park, etc. So I think I think you can almost let that one slide a little bit. But what did you make of the second half performance? Do you think there was a little bit more about Livy in the second half? Or do you think it was, again, just running out ideas a little bit maybe at times? I think the substitutions worked a treat, I have to say. Bruce Anders, there's obviously a huge debate about the number nine role and I, I honestly don't think either Shinny or Anderson have done enough consistently to be starting every single week. But Anderson came on and changed the game for me, certainly. His link-up play was a lot better than it has been. His, his part, obviously, kind of started the move really as well for the goal as well. Um, Martindale, his subs quite often can change the game against Livy. Certainly have done on more occasions than you'd like. Yeah. But I think yeah, all, all three seemed to work uh, yesterday, I have to say. Yeah, it was, I mean, second half, there was, it was like in little bursts, you got a little bit more tempo from us. You get maybe like five, six, seven minute bursts where we looked really at it and really hungry to get the ball back. And then it kind of went flat again. At times it was a, it was a strange second half. Um, I mean, we had a, a couple of chances. Fitzy had a header that went over the bar. I always had a header, which is flashed away. But, but I think Ross County have had their chances in the second half as well. The one where Max has had a little Come bit of rush of blood yeah. to the head. <laughs> Callahan's hit the bar. I think he had one which he kind of tamely put in uh, straight yeah. at Max. But, you know, going back to us, Nicky had an effort which was comfortably safe. But, but going to the goal at the end... We talked about Io and Penner's involvement in the yeah. in the Ross County goal, but they certainly made up for it, didn't they? I no half. See when when Holt pings the ball out to Penrace and it crosses the ball, I'm honestly like that's a horrendous cross. That's far <laughs> too deep. Uh, but obviously, and then uh, I think you've got to question the keeper as well. I thought looking back at it, I thought the keeper should have come for that. It's only three or four yards from the goal. I think he should. I think he should have come from it. But obviously, all well and good that Io's in the centre forward. Io is in the in the right place at the right time. I think. I think Davy got a few ideas with the Io one from last week at at Tanadice because he talked <laughs> about he talked about Ryan Edwards getting chucked up for the last few minutes totally. against us, and I think that's maybe given him some inf- uh, inspiration with Io <laughs> going up, hasn't it? Oh, I definitely. There's nothing more British than chucking the big lanky centre back up. <laughs> up front for the last five minutes when you're a goal down there. But it worked. It doesn't often work, but it, it did work. And as I say, that, that could be a pretty crucial goal when it's all said and done because a defeat yesterday and when you're going into Christmas, kind of the doom and gloom, you know, that having gone, picked up those two wins, all that changes if you then get beat at home to Ross County. It's, it's a good point at the end of the day because it keeps Aye. them at arms arm's length doesn't it a little bit I know they've got a game during the week with uh, St Johnston I think it is just before Christmas so but what was Davy's reaction to the game I, I briefly watched his AFC live stuff but you would have spoke to him as well what was his take on the game? Poor first half which I think uh, 
anyone could see, to be fair. There was definitely a lack of intensity. I, I, I He didn't allude to it, but I think your assessment of both teams kind of not wanting to lose was definitely kind of how it seemed to play out in the first half. He did say that he thought they were unlucky not to win, which I don't necessarily agree with that. I think over the piece of draws, probably fair enough. I think Livy probably had more of the kind of half chances. Yeah. But if Jason Holt scores that at the end where it clips the crossbar, I think I think it would have been a bit harsh on Russ County like. Uh, to be honest, I was more surprised that Holtie took the shot on. I think. I know. He, I how, think many, he's... how many times? How many times yesterday? By the way, was there an opportunity? 20, <laughs> 25 yards out, and you just like hit it, hit it. All three of the mid, all three of the central midfielders, they had chances to, and they just seemed to want to pass it to someone else. So, if you if you don't shoot, you don't score. I think. I think Jason Holt. I think since that shot against Hearts, I think he's almost got a taste for it now. Uh, I had a little dig. Because I don't think he'd hit as many shots as he has in the last four games in his entire time at Livy prior 18, to that. 18 months beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> He's not one for letting one rip from the edge of the box. But <laughs> So kind of looking looking at the game as a whole, points probably a, a decent result. But it's still a frustrating one because it's another home performance where we maybe weren't quite at it. Was there anything you... Was there anyone you would have maybe liked to have seen in the starting eleven? I know it's difficult when we've got back-to-back results against Hibs and Dundee United. Is there anything you'd maybe question about the performance yesterday or the, the team selection? I think, the, the, as kind of alluded to before, there's obviously this debate about the number nine. And uh, Andrew Shinney's not a number nine, let's be honest. He's not a striker. He doesn't think like a striker. But sometimes it does work. Sometimes it does work, and it didn't yesterday. Bad to watch from an attacking standpoint when Andrew Shinney's up there and it doesn't work. So I don't know. I don't. I don't know how you solve that. I don't necessarily think you can just play Bruce Anderson ninety minutes every week because I don't think he's got the consistency to do that. But I think when it's a must, no, not necessarily a must-win game, but it's a when it's a home to Ross County one that you are genuinely targeting three points. I think you've got to play Bruce Anderson up front. It's all right having Shinny because his link-up play is much better. His ability to win free kicks is much better when you're playing Hearts, Hibs, Celtic at home. But when it's Ross County, I would I would have started Anderson, certainly. That's yeah, the main you, one for me. Yeah, as you say, it's, uh, it's the ongoing debate, isn't it? I think if you got... Bruce at one end of the park, Andrew Shin at the other end, and got them to run it to each other really quick and combine Into, the two of them. Aye, totally. I, think, I think you'd almost have your perfect number nine. You'd have Anderson's pace 100%. and his nose for goal. And then, as you yeah. say, Shinny's intelligence and hold up play, you'd almost have the perfect combination, wouldn't you? Aye, aye. No, if you'd, almost, you'd, you'd actually have as close to Lyndon Dykes as Livingston are probably likely to get if you kind of combined the the benefits of both of them, the problem, Shinny's obviously not as good in the air as, as Dice was, but you're no far off it in terms of kind of the pace, intelligence, eye for a pass, game awareness. Dice had all of that. And between Shinny and Anderson, they probably have all of that. But the problem is Shinny's not a striker and he's got no pace. And Anderson's not got the physicality and the link-up play and the kind of game intelligence to kind of be that number nine consistently. And the other, the other talking point for the fans yesterday was having fans behind the goal in the Aye. East Stand as well with Brilliant. the free tickets that were handed out. You obviously cover us every week, Carson. It must have been really good for you to see that as well, seeing the stadium a bit fuller with home fans. Aye, it was good. And I, I noticed they changed the music up as well to be a bit more upbeat so that <laughs> the fans were banging the wee clapper things. Uh, it's quite good to be honest with you. It didn't like b- before, before I joined the Courier, I did a couple of years for the Glasgow Rocks basketball, and that was a very kind of family orientated club where the music and the clappers and all that. It kind of reminded me a wee bit of that, but uh, I it's uh, it was good to see. Obviously, given the kind of current circumstances, it wasn't 
even close to the 3,600 that turned up, which you can understand. Yeah. Um, but a great idea. And even, see, even if they did it the, the last home game before Christmas every year, you get positive publicity out of it. You get the community, you know, kind of taking an interest almost, which you need, you need, you know, somehow, if, if finishing fifth and sixth in consecutive seasons in the Premier League doesn't get you any fans, I don't know what can, other than quite literally handing out free tickets to the next generation and hoping that even one or one or two percent of them kind of become genuine Levy fans. It's the age old debate on the on the forum, isn't it? It tends Aye. to be when the club's in a bit of crisis, the free tickets thing always seems to come <laughs> up for some reason. But so you see it all the time. But it, it was brilliant to see more Aye. fans, more bums on seats. As you say, the the Omicron stuff that's come up recently with COVID is probably terrible timing for this and we might have got Aye. you know an extra few hundred involved in it uh, otherwise. But it was fantastic to see. But as you say, it's it's a difficult balancing act between you know, just handing out free tickets every week and then try to turn those people into paying customers. The club is a business at the end of the day. They need to make money. You know, I'm sure there's a cost involved in us having to get extra security yeah. to cover that. Yeah. So, you know, there's there's all these elements that the club need to, need to balance off. But fair play to Dave Black and, and Derek, uh, who obviously do a lot of work behind the scenes at the club. I'm sure the, the SLO team were probably involved in, in some capacity as well in that. So, Hats off to them for making it happen. And hopefully, as you say, it's something we can see a lot more in the future. But overall, Ross County game, it, it wasn't a classic on the eye, but it could be a vital point come the end of the season. With our last game taking us to the halfway point in our Premiership campaign, there's no better time to do a mid-season review and no better person than Callum to get on to do it as well. So being more of a neutral, Callum, what has your take been on the season so far? Kind of, there was a lot of change over in the summer, wasn't there? So Aye. what? how were you looking at it, reporting on it, with the, the changes in terms of the squad and also the backroom staff as well? Didn't really know what to expect in the season as much as I think Davey's always very honest but when he comes out and says oh it's going to be great I think this is the best team we've got you do kind of have to take it with a wee pinch of salt I think obviously the COVID and the illnesses and everything all that at the start of the season had a real impact because you were probably five or six league games into the season before you actually had everyone fit and healthy which doesn't help in terms of kind of the, where they are at the midway point of the season uh, they've taken quite a strange way to essentially be where you kind of thought they would be yeah but I think I, I think most Levy fans would have been fairly happy sitting eighth and what is it six points off the bottom five points off the playoffs especially given it was such a, a kind of brand new team I think good, but could have been better. Yeah, there's been there's been a handful of games that have maybe got away from us. You know, looking aye, at there's been, aye, there's been some really bad performances, like ones that are unlivy like performances where you're actually questioning the desire. Almost sometimes, you know, like hearts away, you're kind of looking at that and going, "Are there eleven people on the pitch there that are actually?" given a hundred percent here. I'm sure there are, obviously, but it comes across that there's been a few kind of lethargic games, Aberdeen away as well. You kinda of, it's those sort of performances that make it all the more frustrating when you see how they performed against Hearts at home, even though it was a defeat, Hibs at home, you know, I mean the, they were incredible against Hibs. And that first 45 minutes against Hearts, I was chatting to Davy a few days after it. And he likened it to the Motherwell game, mind a couple of years ago, when Motherwell yeah. was third. It was, was it, who, who was the keeper? Was It It wasn't Trevor Carson, who was it? He's uh, Gillespie. It was, uh, Gillespie, Mark Gillespie, Gillespie who went, went down south, I think he went to Newcastle, uh, didn't he? 
I mean, it, that game was six or seven. Now it was one nothing going on six or seven, and that was Davy said that was probably the best football they've played since then. Albeit it kind of ended quite abruptly in the second half. <laughs> As you say, Carson, the start of the season we had a few issues with COVID as well. And, you know, I spoke to David at the start of the season as well, and he was talking about the, the fixture list. Aye. The combination of that fixture list plus the a lot of new players coming in, those issues with COVID, it, it really wasn't the the most the easier starts to the season, was it? No, not at all. It what it was really difficult, but you're kind of hoping out of all of those games, you're kind of hoping for at least one or two results, you know. Obviously, they got the Celtic result, but a win at home against Celtic is pretty much given, is it not? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly has since we've come back up, isn't it? It's uh, almost our guaranteed points in the season at home to Celtic. Other, what, what was it? After eight games? Was it four points after eight games? I think it was one win, a draw and six defeats. Yeah. You're kind of hoping, you know, Hibs away, things like that. Those are games where Livingston teams in previous seasons have gone and got results so that was the worrying thing at the start, it was that hold on, we are actually getting beat every single week here yes, you've got the caveat of playing the top six in the first seven games or whatever it was Max is kind of clanging it against Aberdeen Yeah, you know, you don't, you don't know how much that's affected Confidence in the kind of ensuing two or three games. And to be honest, obviously the situation with Daniel Barden as well. I don't think you can kind of underestimate how much of an emotional kind of impact that will have had on the players. Because I, I know it came out publicly, I think, was it just before or just after the St. Johnston game, maybe? Yeah, I think it, I think um, it was uh, just before the Ross County game. I think Ross uh, County, that was it. But it was known for a good three or four weeks before that. I remember the, the defeat against St Mirren, where I think that's where a lot of people started calling for Davy's head. That was that was when I personally knew about it. So if I knew about it, the players would have known about it. And I don't know, it, it's tough. I think a lot of people don't appreciate the kind of everyday struggles that go on behind the scenes. You know, people have relatives who die, people have relationships that break down. All it takes is one or two of them behind the scenes at the same time. And you can quickly have two or three players that aren't maybe quite at it. When you're Livingston, let's be honest, you can't really afford to go into games with two or three players who kind of heads aren't quite in the game. Exactly. I can't even imagine how because at the end of the day it's a it's a work colleague. You know, of course it's the best way we can look at it for, for the players, isn't it? And yeah. it's a mate as well. So I, I can't imagine the, the stress that that would have put on the on the players as well. But you, you mentioned that St. Mirren game. Davy came out with some comments, didn't he? Afterwards, a little there was a little dig at the fans. Uh, what what was your what was your take on that? I know it's probably just a frustration thing that Davies came out with because I know in recent weeks he's you know he's been very Aye. Very grateful for the support that the players have got, you know, especially up at Tanadice. He was very public in saying that. So, what was your kind of take on that? I to to me, it was it was a guy who was just frustrated. Like at that point, I say I think that was where it was. That was the eighth game, I think, where where it was kind of four points after eight games. And at that at that point, he even he's probably questioning whether he's got it right in the summer with the signings and the. And whether it's whether the formation's working, whether and aye, the fans obviously weren't happy. Albeit, I didn't actually think the performance in that particular yeah. game was that bad. If Livy had won that one nothing, I don't think Jim Goodwin would have had too many complaints. But aye, that was it. It wasn't quite to the same degree. But when Gary Hall came out after they got beat against St Mirren, for it would have been. Yeah. The last season and said I have to question whether I'm the right man for the job or whether I'm good enough to do this job or whether I've served my time or whatever it was he along those lines, whatever it was he actually said, that was a kind of moment where I thought, oh right, 
if this doesn't change quickly, this could get ugly very quickly. But in fairness, it has it's turned around to some degree. It's been three defeats in the last 11, which <laughs> you can't really complain too much about that. No, exactly. I think, uh, as you say, it was a it was a frustration comment. And ah. I remember making it, I kind of went through the, the previous league games and came out with some stats. But And I think when I reviewed the submitting game, I was very downbeat. But kind of looking back at the game, you actually think we deserve more from it than, ah. than we got. And ah. it, it was one of those uh, frustrating games where you probably are the better team and you don't get anything. But because of the run of form you're on, you're just miserable. And, <laughs> and as a fan, you come away really frustrated from it as well. But yeah, you mentioned Daniel Barden. Obviously, the, the players all did the yeah. November uh, campaign. You've been behind the scenes. You've seen the players up close. Who, who produced the best hash? Jason Holt. <laughs> uh, it's got to be. It's got to be. It was spectacular. There was, there was actually a few players where I, I couldn't actually tell that they were doing November, if I'm being perfectly honest. And I think I need to give a special mention to Derek White as well, because I certainly had absolutely no idea that he was doing <laughs> November. And it was, I think it was the press conference, and it was genuinely something like the 28th of November, and you couldn't tell. <laughs> I take it he was just using tweezers to, to shave off his moustache when he was been, finished, eh? It must have been. Uh, in fact, one of, the, one, of the, one of the guys at the press conference said... Uh, as he said, I, if you keep it going until next no- November, you might have a decent most. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned Holtie's one. Holtie's is brilliant because I don't think I've ever seen Holtie with facial hair. No, no, and... it's, it's incredible. It was like 1950s East Germany stuff. It? it was spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> the, other one, the other one I thought was pretty impressive was Wee Chebs. Uh, Wee uh, Chebs produced you, a pillar, you, of, a, uh, pillar uh, of a dash. You could see him while uh, he bun it in a pipe you'd <laughs> be an extra on still game I reckon <laughs> I reckon we Cheb would have been an extra on still game with that Tash as you say with the pipe in the butt I think you could have seen him in the clans with no ball definitely brilliant, <laughs> brilliant. Uh, fair, play, fair play to them all for doing it I have to say yeah, it's a it's a fantastic cause, and I'm sure you can still donate in some capacity to the to the campaign. Uh, I'm sure, but as you say, after that St. Mirren game, things did pick up for the better. Aye. We we got a couple of back to back wins, uh, St. Johnston, then Ross County, but there seemed to be an element of a bit of the old Livy creeping back into us, wasn't there? And it seemed to coincide with Scott Pittman coming back into the side. He's been in and out of the side. How big impact yeah. do you think the fact that Pitts has been in and out of the team this year due to injury, which is very unusual for Pitts? It's a funny one because he's probably, when, when you go into the se- when you go into the season, he's probably one of the first two or three names in the team sheet. And when he's not in the team, certainly earlier in the season when he's not been in the team, you can tell that he's not been in the team. They've missed that kind of driving force from the midfield. But right now, I'm not even sure he gets back into the team, if I'm being well, that's honest. Blas- that's blasphemy to say that. It is, Scott Pittman it, doesn't it, get it, in the team. I mean, Holt and, Holt and Omionga have been, for me, right now, Holt's the player of the season, for me. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with that, yeah. But Omionga's probably been the best player in the last couple of months. So that's... that's Two midfield player, you can't you can't take Holton on the out of the team, and <sighs> Jack McMillan to centre midfield has absolutely worked. I don't know, I don't know. Do you take him out of the team? Is the it's... obvious is the obvious candidate. Let's be fair, but I don't know if he's he's not performed badly enough to warrant getting dropped. Put it that way. And is that one? That's probably been one of the. You know, talking about players playing positions, we we obviously had the Anderson Shinny discussion. Aye. But did you ever see Jack McMillan coming in and playing centre mid? No, <laughs> <laughs> not, not a chance. In fact, those so I I sit next to the guy that does the kind of opta stats. Yeah. For games, and it's all he always comes to me to kind of double check the the formation and the and the team lines and all that. And I'm sure I had Jack McMillan on the right wing for that game against Hearts, it did not even cross my mind that he would be 
a central midfielder. But he was out. He was outstanding against Hearts. He was outstanding against Hibs. Dipped perhaps slightly in the last couple of games, but he still put in a solid, solid performance against Dundee United and against Ross County as well. Um, but I, it's worked. There's, there's several times where you question what Davy's thinking, and sometimes it works. And sometimes it doesn't. And he's he's got Jack McMillan as central midfield. He's definitely got that working. None of these decisions though have worked as well as putting Hakim Adolphin up top against Hearts a couple of seasons back. None of these tactical <laughs> switches have worked as well as that. <laughs> and, and then he he starts as a central midfielder where Aki's eh? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I still I, I still laugh thinking about Haki would often running about up top. That is one of the best things I've ever seen. Um, you know, Hakeem, that's just a, a wee Hakeem story here. Not so much a Hakeem story, but uh, Hakeem signed the same day as Lyndon Dykes and I had a phone call. It was, it was either Davey or Holtley, I can't remember. But anyway, they told me basically to come down to the stadium to interview Lyndon Dykes and he hadn't even signed at that point. So we waited for three hours because he was still negotiating his contract. Well, obviously, they, Davey, by all accounts, presumably used us as some kind of pawn in the in the final negotiations. All oh, the press are already here to interview him. And he did, I, he did not even tell me that Hakim had signed earlier that day. Had had no idea until Livy actually announced it themselves online that, they, that they'd signed someone else the same day. <laughs> So that, that shows you kind of how highly they thought of, of <laughs> Big London and perhaps not quite so highly how they thought of, of Hakeem. But fair play, he's, he's, his move to Aki's worked out a treat for him. Certainly a move to central midfield worked for him as well. And as we as we were saying, a recent run of results, you mentioned the performances against the likes of Hearts, Hibs, uh, Monday United. What would you say is the performance that's really stuck out Sorry, stood out for you this season and what performance has probably been the, the low point so far in the campaign? For me, the low point has definitely been hearts away. I'll kind of asterisk that with the fact that I didn't make it up to Aberdeen for the midweek game, which by all accounts was just as bad. I'm still defrosting from the <laughs> Aberdeen game. <laughs> the, the Hibs game has been... In terms of the overall performance, I think the Hibs game uh, genuinely could have been three or four. Uh, and the fact that Hibs had an absolute meltdown makes it all the better as well. Um, oh, oh, it was beautiful. It was beautiful obviously, viewing. Obviously, the home win against Celtic was a tremendous performance, but it was very much kind of your typical Levy v Celtic 20, 25% possession type performance for the most enjoyable football, how well they played. So I would say the Hibs game was was great. And kind of going back to the, the Shinny Anderson debate, I, <laughs> we Forest at number nine yeah. the last 20 minutes against Hibs was exceptional. So maybe, maybe that's the answer. Maybe it's not Shinny or <laughs> Anderson. Maybe it's Alan Forrest that needs to be the number nine. And you've You've mentioned we've mentioned a few times the the number of players that have come in the door. Uh, Out of the new arrivals, who would you say has been the pick of the bunch this season? Omionga, so far. I mean, obviously he came in a wee bit late. Uh, I think it was seven or eight games into the season before he actually made his debut. Probably took another four or five games for him to kind of properly settle in. Um, but if he continues to play like he has done the last eight weeks or so, then it might actually be difficult to keep hold of him in the summer. Uh, he's been tremendous. Uh, trying to think. Pen- Penrice has probably been the biggest surprise, I will say, especially, especially given the fact Davey signed about 24 left-backs. <laughs> you, you, you know, I, you're going into the season, when I, when I tend to, before the first game of the season, when I kind of had a wee go at kind of what the strongest match day 18 would be, Penrice wasn't even in the squad for me, right. you know. And I think a lot of people probably thought that it was a kind of a squad signing 
a guy who was versatile, who was still young enough to improve. But you'd have to say he's probably the best left back at the club now. Yeah, I think Penners was a was an interesting one because his first spell he only played a couple of games maybe at left back, so I'd never I, really seen him play there. But he was exceptional in a in a three in midfield, which is what I, we're playing these yeah, days. Yeah, and I think if you look at the in particular the Aberdeen game and Celtic games where he's played in the middle of the park this season, he's been brilliant in I, those games. He has been. But yeah. you were sitting going, do you see him being a, a centre mid for us with? Because we have got a lot of lot of options in there as well, and I think he had a hernia op fairly recently, yeah. didn't he? And yeah, he's yeah. he's obviously come back into the side and played left back in this upturn of results, this recent mm-hmm. upturn of results. And as you say, he's been brilliant. He's been brilliant. He's been linking up really well while in Forest down that side in particular. Ah. And it was despite the number of signings we had that could play left back, it was still proven to be a bit of a problem position at the start of the season. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Cause I, I know Jacko had issues with, with little niggles and injuries and right. obviously Penners was then out. Adam Lewis has been out who can play there as well. So, right. and then I Sean Kelly has well. been yeah. in and out of squads as well who right. can play there. So it's been a, been a bit of a problem position, but I, I'd agree with you certainly in recent weeks, he's, he's probably taken me a little bit by surprise as well, right. how good he's been there. And kind of look in, towards the rest of the season, Carson, I'm sure you'll be very much echoing what we tend to say every season, 10th place is the aim. Oh, 100%. Where, where, do you see, where do you see Livy finishing up this season? I guess a lot of that depends on how, how good Big John Nubley is. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very difficult to see them finishing in the top six for me, just because they are so inconsistent. I do think that they are, I don't want to say too good to go down, but I think, I don't think they're the worst team in the league by any stretch. But all it takes, it's so tight, all it takes is a bad three or four weeks and you're sitting comfortable in seventh and actually you're suddenly one point adrift at the bottom, you know. Uh, I would, I'll say, I'll stick, I'll stick with eight. Just now, I think I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not overly confident that they'll stay. <laughs> oh no, you sound completely convinced, Carson. <laughs> oh, it's just because it's so tight. Eh? The bottom I, five teams are essentially all the same. I think this season, if you look back at the season that we did the Great Escape under Richard Goff, right. I think going into the final day. There was four teams that could all go down. You can see that I, happening. I think, yeah, yeah. I think you could, uh, it's completely conceivable you could have six teams involved uh, going into the bottom six. Uh, I, gen- I genuinely think it's going to be that tight this year because as you say, there's very little to pick between a lot of the sides and that's been evident in some of the games this season. It's It's been a, a moment in games. like Take the Motherwell game as an example. You know, it's one each. Nicky Devlin misses an unbelievable chance. Aye. And will score at the other end. Yeah, you know, totally. you know, there's been the St Mirren game as well. A goalkeeper mistakes the difference in the game, Aye. essentially, at the end of the day. So it's it's very marginal things in some of the games this season. You mentioned uh, Joel Newbley coming back in January. Aye. You're the man in the know. As uh, I think Davies mentioned maybe a couple of faces. Uh, what sort of activity do you reckon in January? The goalkeeping situation obviously needs addressed, but it is very much a case of Davy waiting until Norwich say whether Barton returning is realistic or not. Yeah. I think the best situation for everyone involved would be Daniel Barton to come back to Livy, but football's not really the important thing there. Exactly, um, yes. That's that's secondary in that situation, isn't that so? the situation still is that Olivia need a number two slash someone that can challenge Max for number one, whether that's Barden or someone else. Obviously, a big new, new blaze coming back. Davy says he's after an offensive player, which I assume would be a winger, mainly, mainly because he doesn't play central attacking midfielders. Yeah. You know, and the central attacking midfielders he does have, he doesn't play there. <laughs> <laughs> so when you see I, I don't know 
specific names, but when you're seeing folk like Walker mentioned, the boy for Blackpool, Apta, has a Scotland under 20 international. He's a winger, you know, so it seems like that's the kind of main focus. We Stiv's been training with us, hasn't he, for a few weeks since aye, leaving Motherwell as well? Aye, it would be an interesting one. I think the big problem there is the fact he's hardly kicked the ball for 18 months. Yeah. That's the big issue there. If you're getting, if you were offering a contract to Steve Lawless, knowing that he'd be the Steve Lawless from two seasons, three seasons ago, then it's a no-brainer. Aye, aye, it's a, it's a difficult one that because he's I don't I don't see how he is at the same level he was when he left, having essentially had two bad moves since. Um, but that type of player, you can you can see that they probably do need another creative option on the wings. I think Bailey Forrest, a, a great Sebald can do the job there as well. But there's not much, there's not much kind of below that. Well, I'm sure it'll be a season of twists and turns. It already has been this season. So, but I'm hoping we can go on your really convincing uh, prediction of eighth place at the end of the season, Carson. <laughs> uh, look, any, any, they'll finish somewhere between third and twelfth. <laughs> <laughs> what you don't think we can charge for the, the league? Uh, oh, that's, no, I think that's I think embarrassing. That, Is that that's gone? Yeah, that's just being bad. No, that, <laughs> look, all, all that matters is they stay up. You know, if they end up staying up on goal difference, if they win the playoff final on penalties, if they end up, you know, if they finish seventh with 48 points, whatever, as long as they stay up, it's a successful season. I'm delighted to welcome on the man behind Viva Motherwell, Dylan, onto the podcast. Dylan, how are you doing, mate? I'm absolutely brilliant. Thank you for having me on. Ah, no worries. It's uh, it's good to have you on. So, I mean, it's been a pretty good start to the season for Motherwell. What have you made of their start to the campaign? Um, do, do you know what? It's, it's weird being a Motherwell fan and being a bit optimistic for a change. It's kind of, I feel like if, if you ask me most seasons, I'll come on and be a bit kind of doom and gloom and all that. But that, this season's honestly been been brilliant to start with. I think we've got a really we've got a really young squad with a lot of talented players in it and you're kinda of, you're seeing a bit of a bond with the supporters. There's a lot of kind of big personalities in there as well and it's it's really good to kinda of see it all come together. Um it's not I wouldn't say it's been a smooth journey under Alexander by any means so far, yeah. but I think now we are finally starting to see the results of it. Yeah, no, I mean you said about that it's not been a smooth transition. Obviously Robinson had done such a great job before him. So it's quite a difficult job to come into, but I've seen a few comments about the style of football under Alexander. What's been your take on it? Because some folk have said it's maybe not the easiest on the eye at times. It's it's interesting sometimes. <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> um, so we, we have this habit of we'll, we'll go a goal up early on, which obviously is brilliant. But when we go a goal up, we just hold on to it and we just say, right, that's it. We've got a lead. Let's sit back. And obviously, like, if you're a fan, it can get a bit frustrating. You also you want to see your team always pushing forward, don't you? Um, so I can see why it's a bit frustrating, but at the end of the day, like it's getting results just now. It's we've had some great wins at home. At home, especially, we've been absolutely solid. Um, we have absolutely battled hearts. We convincingly be Aberdeen at home, and his tactics really, for the most part, are working. Um, what, what I would say is that sometimes when the football isn't as pleasing on the eye, when the results don't start to come, you can turn on the manager a lot more. Yeah. But as the results are fine just now, like we, I guess I can really have no complaints in that sense. But yeah, it's a bit it's a bit similar with us this season. We've talked about it on the podcast that when we've not been at it this season, or there's been a bit of an identity crisis, it's been so apparent in some games. You know, we've just looked horrendous. Like I take it the examples you're talking about are probably the game up at Dens Park, for example. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a big one. I wasn't I wasn't at it personally, but from what I felt, it was looking at the stats. It was uh, pretty grim, to be honest with you. Um, and I think it, it can be frustrating, maybe sometimes, just not having that consistency. But then the thing is, is that, like being a Motherwell fan, you don't really get consistency very often. But but, but like I said, there is like there's 
there's definitely a lot more reasons to be optimistic just now. Like I say, the squad's brilliant. I feel like Alexander is he's getting to grips with his best eleven. We've got John Cornelius coming through. He scored an absolute belt of a goal yesterday. He's first goal for the club. Yeah. And it, it does really just mean a lot of optimism, even if there is some some bumps in the road every once in a while. But and one of the star men from Motherwell this season has been Tony Watt, and there's been a bit of talk this week about um, uh, turning down a new contract. Uh, along with him, who's really stood out for Motherwell this season? So, so Tony Watt is is definitely the the main one. Um, I think a, a big a Motherwell massive fan favourite is Kevin Van Dien up front. He's just a big. He's that he's that type of player. If you're playing against him, you absolutely hate him because he yeah. just winds people up. And the amount of stupid your luck he's had this season for like pushing folk here and there and just being a bit of a wind up more than anything. But but technically he's superb as well. He's an absolute joy to watch sometimes. But apart from that, we've got also you, you guys will know Liam Kelly fairly well. He's yeah. seems to be making a world class save literally every game just now. So when that's going well, it's good as well. Uh, Be- Bevis Mugabe at the back is another one I probably want to mention as well. His, um, his development since he's came with the club has been exceptional and he's really becoming a real a real standout centre half, I'd say. Maybe not just in Willow, but in the top six in general. Just now I'd say he is probably one of the better the better centre halves. And what is your take on the kind of Tony Watt situation? Is our Motherwell fans maybe fearing he could move on in January, you maybe try and cash in? Because I've seen there's been a bit of interest from down south. So is it is it something Motherwell might look to do, or would you just take your chances and keep them till the end of the season? It's a, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because you don't know. He's obviously scored a lot of goals for us this season. If you if you part with that in January, it might be a bit a bit tough to replace. Um, I I guess it just depends on if we get if we get a bid which matches the club's valuation. Um, the the judging by what's been reported in the media, Tony does seemingly want to leave. Um, which I guess it would it would be disappointing. I guess maybe if you look at his career pattern, it's not exactly a, a surprise to many folks getting to move on to a club. But it's yeah, it would, it would be disappointing to see him go. Definitely, like I say, whether that's January or the summer, I think would probably just depend on whether we get a good enough bid in January or not. And I'm not sure. There's not really been any figures report he does in terms of the valuation yet. But I guess it's just kind of need, need to wait and see in that sense. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Liam Kelly, other le- ex Livy man that's playing fairly regular as Ricky Lamy. What have you made of the two of them since they've arrived at Motherwell? Well, for, first and foremost, Ke- Kelly's been outstanding. Like, they barely ever put a foot wrong. Um, but as I was saying earlier, he seems to be making a world class save just about every, every game just now. And some of the time, some of the saves he's been making is it's incredible. Um, Lamy's interested. I think I think most Motherwell fans would tell you that he really didn't get off to a good start, to be honest with you. Um, we we played him um, as like a kind of he, he filled in for our left back who was injured and he just didn't really look comfortable in the position and I think yeah. a lot of the fans kind of did wrote him off quite early but that this season when he's played he's been superb um well one of the things I've noticed particularly is that bringing the ball out for the back he's really good at he can kind of spring a pass in behind which when you're kind of like a counter attacking team like us is really good. Yeah, so it's good. It's good to see him kind of growing in confidence. Um, unfortunately, he's picked up an injury, so I'm not sure if he will make the game in Boxing Day. But but definitely, he's improved for when he came in. Definitely. Yeah, Liam. Liam was fantastic for us, and he, Liam got a bit of criticism. He he was on loan to us in League One when we won the league, and uh, he got a bit of criticism for a couple of mistakes he made, in particular against these five. But so fans weren't overly pleased when we re-signed him when we got promoted to the Premiership, and. He was unbelievable that season uh, and obviously got resulted in getting called into the Scotland squad and things like that. But he's he's certainly a great character and he's made a massive impact at, at Motherwell. And then Lammy's one, again, probably a bit similar to Motherwell fans. He really split opinion with Livy fans because he kind of, he was a, he filled in everywhere. He filled in at left wing back, left back, centre half. He never kind of had a run of games in one position. Uh, I think was kind of Ricky's downfall at Livy. But he, he was solid enough for us. He'd he done a job over his couple of seasons at the club. Yeah, and honestly, I think that's what a lot of other fans would say has been the exact same with us as well. Look, he does there's that kind of that dependable we can come. You know, when he's on form, he can come in and kind of do a job in that sense. Whether yeah. he's good enough to be a first team left back, I don't think so. But it's good to know that if we do end up having injuries, he can kind of slot in along the back line as well. And what what can Livy fans expect from Motherwell when we go to Far Park on Boxing Day? What how do Motherwell 
typically set up uh, formation wise and and what who are the real danger men uh, that we need to look out for? Well, this is kind of the interesting thing is correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think you've been playing four three three last couple of games, haven't you? Yeah, the vast majority of the season we've been playing a four three three. Yeah, and and that's the same as we set up as well. So I think. You'll probably see a lot of kind of really interesting battles, um, particularly in the midfield. If if Cornelius starts a game, which if based on Saturday's performance, they definitely should time up against someone like Tommy Onga, because I think they're both really energetic battles, middle of the yeah. park. I think that'd be an interesting one to watch. Um, in terms in terms of danger, man, obviously Tony Watts kind of hard to ignore. He'll play if we set up the same way we played on Saturday. He'll play with Van Veen and Willoughby. Yeah, who's obviously Van Veen's a bit more technical, brings the ball into feet, maybe takes a man on. Willoughby's a bit quicker and a bit kind of better in there. He's more of maybe physical attributes than, than the other two are. Yeah. But it's, it's, just, it's just kind of, it's, it, 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 is, it can be a bit hard on the eye sometimes to play <laughs> football, to say the least. So if, if we go one nil up, and it's a, it's a credit to us that if we go one nil up, I think you guys would find it really hard to get back in the game because we are yeah. very good at just sort of shutting teams out just now. It's probably it's probably um, been our downfall this season is an attacking sense probably our defensive record's actually not that bad on par with the rest of the league, but it's it's going forward. And I think when we do go behind in games in particular, I think we do struggle to break teams down. So uh, here's hoping we get the first goal in the game if there are any. Yeah, and, and then we're the exact same. I think if you guys break the first, if you guys get the first goal, I would be expecting a tough time. And obviously, you guys are good at good at defending as well so I think it'll be a game where the first goal is very very important to say the least and what are you predicting for the Boxing Day game uh, are you expecting another Motherwell win or do you think Levy can cause a wee bit of an um, upset given the league table just now well, but we, do, we do seem to be really good at home and I think I think we probably hopefully should back that up with a good performance in Boxing Day um, I'll say I'll say a narrow win. I'll say one 0 we'll, we'll, we'll get we'll get our goal and we'll sit back a little bit. <laughs> I'd imagine, but, but yeah, we'll you, go one 0 You need to back up what you've been preaching on the podcast, don't you? So <laughs> yeah, and, um, what, and watch it. Now that I've said this, we'll have a three 0 free flowing football. <laughs> <laughs> total total tiki taka and stuff. Like. Uh, t- to be fair, see for Park for us over the over recent years. It's we either play quite well or we play horrific. We especially our first season back up. We had two horror show first half performances at Fur Park where we were 3-0 down at half time um, but there's been other games I think the last time we won was either 2002 or 2003 at Fur Park so it's not been a good hunting ground for Jeez. us at the best of times so Jeez, oh, yeah. it's a long time ago isn't it? I know <laughs> um, I, remember, I remember to be fair there was one game when you I think it was the first season you guys came back up and did Scott Pittman scored a free kick from right and see I think you drew one each it, uh, it was Keegan Jacobs scored an absolute pearl Keegan but, Jacobs uh, that's of that, a free that kick a ball, ball, and sorry. we played we played alright that day and that's what I mean we're either we either play okay at Motherwell and fairly competitive or we just seem to have an absolute horror show since we've come back up yeah. I'm really like last season the 3-1 game for example we were awful that day um, but the oh, two each game at the I start died. of the season we were excellent so it's yeah it's, as I say it's a strange ground for us we either we either put in a decent display or it's the polar opposite so I don't I have no idea what to expect from us to be honest yeah and, you know what's funny is I'd actually say that we are we are the same going away to Levy <laughs> as well like some of the performances we've put in at your ground have been utterly terrible over the last couple of years <laughs> and then we'll also we, we'll get a random win here and there but oh, some of the some of the ones don't be thinking about to be honest with you but <laughs> so Dylan you you run the Viva Motherwell Twitter account uh, for our listeners give us a little flavour of what it is you do on the account and where we can find you on Twitter as well yeah so it's just a lot of kind of a lot of stats about Motherwell. Um, I used I used to kind of do things during the games and all that updates and all that. I've sort of toned back on that this year a little bit. So it's just sort of like your typical transfer news. Uh, I try and post interesting stats and stuff like that. Just whatever kind of it's been reported over the week. It's just a kind of a, a centralised Motherwell news feed to keep up with everything in a sense. So you can find you can find me over there. Or my personal Twitter is at Dylan Ingles with two A's. Perfect. Well, Dylan, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, I mean this in the nicest possible way. I hope you have a thoroughly miserable boxing day <laughs> come three o'clock, uh, come five o'clock. But uh, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and obviously wish yourself and Motherwell the best for the rest of the season. Same to you guys. Thanks a lot for having me again.
that's it for this week's episode of Talk Livy. Thanks again to every single one of you for tuning in week in, week out. If you can, we'd love to hear your feedback. Either leave us a review on iTunes or simply message us on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. We are on all those social media channels and you can just search Talk Livy to find us and you'll find all the links to our weekly episodes on there as well. You can also find all our episodes, including this one on all good podcast streaming sites, including iTunes and Spotify. We're also on YouTube, so don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And if none of those options suit you, all you have to do is head to our website, talklivypodcast.libson.com, where you'll find every single episode we've done over the last few years. That's it for this week. Thanks again to Callum Carson for coming on and joining us. Uh, much appreciated as always, Callum. No worries. I, I hope Santa's good to you and gets you a wee edry kit this year. Jesus Christ, that, that'll be a good dartboard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, I can throw a nine darter like Willie Borland did the other night. Oh, on it. <laughs> what, uh, some scenes that I want it. Wow, oh, it, was, it was brilliant. And the what, fact that he'd boy, been getting it was brilliant that the fact that he'd been getting Scotland get hammered everywhere they go um, oh. and, and then produced that. It was fantastic. But congratulations to Willie, by the way, because I know he used to go to a number of Lovey games as well. So, uh, well done on that. But Thanks again for our listeners for, for tuning in as always and let's hope for another great week following the Lothian's finest football team and more importantly, have a very good Christmas and a new year when that comes round as well. to them.